Dumilang Saniwanani. Hello, everyone. It's Helen here, or as you can call me, Mama H. And we are therefore involved with life sciences. At the moment, we're focusing on population ecology. And today, the focus of our investigation is into interactions in the environment. Now, let's have a look at a question. We know that ecology is the study of interactions in an ecosystem, but when we talk about interactions, what kinds of interactions are there that exist between members, not only of the same species, but between members of different species? So it's all very well forming a definition and saying ecology is the study of interactions in an environment, but what are these interactions? And that is what we're going to be looking at in this lesson. So let's have a look at our concept map. We can tick off quite a few sections from previous lessons, and this is where we're focusing today interactions in the environment. So let's break down that broad topic of interactions in the environment. What smaller topics are we going to look at? Well, we're going to be looking at something called predation, competition, specialization, and symbiosis. So are you ready? For our keywords, remember that the keywords are useless if just thrown at you as definitions. Rather, let's learn about them in context. But a great way of learning about them is also to put them into a little book or into a glossary where you can refer to term and definition when you're studying to really brush up on your facts. So the terms that we're looking at today, predator, prey, predation, we can see that those terms are going to, to kind of relate to each other. Something called dynamic equilibrium, competition, and even though it's spelt niche, we pronounce it niche, and these terms are linked together, symbiosis, mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. So, we've got a full basket of goodies ahead. Let's not waste any time. Let's remind ourselves of what we already know. A population is a group of individuals of the same species. So, there's our population of little meerkats that we've been talking about. We're focusing also in this particular lesson on communities. Remember that communities were a whole lot of different populations. So there we've got the lions and the zebra and the little meerkats. All of these communities living in the same area is also our focus today. So we're not only looking at populations, but also at how communities, which are different populations, how they all interact with each other. So in a natural habitat, different populations are going to depend on one another. Remember, some are going to eat others, and some are going to rely on others for other things as well that we're going to be exploring in this lesson. So these different populations or our community is going to be full of these wonderful interactions that we need to isolate. And it makes a lot of sense to kind of put these in different groups. And we're going to start off with our first group or first kind of interaction known as predation. So I think this little picture sums it up very nicely in predation, we've got two organisms, and they're going to be from different populations. We're going to see a relationship between predators 
and prey. The predator is the one that does the hunting and the catching and the eating. And the prey, well, that is the population that does the running away or the swimming away or the trying to avoid being eaten action. Now, predator and prey populations are usually in what we call dynamic equilibrium. That sounds strange if you break up that term. Dynamic means to change. And equilibrium means to stay the same. So what on earth are we talking about when we think about dynamic equilibrium? Well, they are changing. That's the dynamic part. But they're going to balance each other out, which is where the equilibrium bit comes into play. Now, one of the most classic and famous examples of a predator-prey relationship is that between the lynx and the hare. All right? The lynx is indigenous to North America, and this is the little snowshoe hare where we see that that is the population that is the prey population. So what is the relationship? between these two organisms. Well, if you look at this graph, you can see that here on this axis, we've got the number of animals in the population. On our x-axis, we've got over the years. And in the green, we are showing the hair, and in the purple, we're showing the population of lynx. So let's start off following the hair. We can see that the hair population increased and just behind it, the lynx population was increasing. More hairs, more food for the lynx. That means that food is not limiting, so the lynx population will grow. But then we start to see something interesting happening to the hare population. It drops. Why? Because the lynx population is becoming too large. In other words, there's too many predators and not enough prey species. We're seeing then, after a while, our predator population dropping and our prey population, wow, skyrocketing because no predators, free for all. We are so happy that the lynx population is dying off. But as that hare population starts increasing, the lynx population also starts increasing. And so we can see that there are these fluctuations and there are time lags. We'll see that the prey population peaks first and the predator population peaks later. And this is simply because our predator and prey populations are adapted to each other. They have certain adaptations that will allow them to catch prey or to evade predators. So the idea of dynamic equilibrium means that constantly numbers are changing. But if we had to take an average, we'll see that these two populations are in balance. They are keeping a control on each other, which is very, very useful. And if we see our link to our lesson on growth curves, we're seeing, are we seeing the J-shaped exponential or are we seeing an S shape? Well, we're clearly seeing repeated J shaped graphs going on here. We're seeing what we call boom and busts. We're seeing a population increasing, but then something else is bringing it under control, so the population decreases. So we're seeing an exponential kind of growth curve that is increasing, decreasing, increasing, in decreasing again over many, many periods of time. And this is typical of an interaction between 
a predator and a prey. We're going to take a short break now, and when we come back, we're going to look at our next example of an interaction in the environment, and that is competition. <music> Everyone, tell me, did you go and grab something to drink during the break or a snack to eat? And how many of you are watching this together? So was there a mad dash for getting something to drink? And did you have to share it? Did you have to compete for it? Well, that is what is happening in natural environments as well. Resources are fought over. And that is what we talk about by competition. So when we look at competition, we see that a resource, or in your instance, maybe in everyday language, a prize is limited. Limited resources mean that individuals have to compete. So just as you might be running a race and you're competing for first prize, as far as being the winner of the race is concerned, we need to think of resources in an environment as prizes, things that individuals are going to compete for. Now, think back over our previous lessons. What kind of resources do you think would automatically spring to mind that are going to spark off some ideas of competition. Just as you and your friends might compete over cold drink or a sandwich, so organisms in a natural environment are going to compete over food, water. Can you think of other things you compete against each other for? Well, let's look at it in terms of natural environments and populations, and let's see how competition impacts on these interactions. In a community, now straight away, I want to stop there and say, we're talking not only about populations now, one population, but we're talking about different populations that are going to be interacting with each other. So therefore, we're talking about a community. And we're going to see organisms compete for the same resources. So maybe they're competing for food or water. Or in the case of a population, they could be competing for mates. Individuals of the same species competing for mates. Organisms are going to be competing for nesting sites or breeding sites. These are going to be well-sheltered areas in the ecosystem that are conducive either for laying eggs or for bringing up young or for birthing young. So those sites, those spaces in the environment are competed for. Territory is something else that's important. In many animal species, we're going to see uh, members of the population competing for a particular space or a territory. And they're going to defend that territory. They're going to spend a lot of energy advertising, this is my territory. Any female organism found in this territory is mine, or any food found in this territory is mine. So territories are important to a lot of populations. These are all examples of resources that can be competed for. So if you have a look at these pictures, and we will get back to them again a little later, look and see what do you think is being competed for. What in each of these situations are the animals competing for? 
as I said, I'll come back and we'll talk about it, but predict those ideas of what is being competed for in those pictures right now. Now, there are two different kinds of competition that exist, and we need to be able to distinguish between the two, and the two terms sound very similar. They are inter-specific competition and intra-specific competition. So there's, once again, the English language making your life sciences life a lot more difficult. When we talk about inter-specific competition, we're talking about different species. There's species one, here's species two. Two different species competing for the same resource. So if you think about a water hole in a game park, that is the resource. Water is being competed for. Water is our contested resource. And it's going to be different species that are competing for the same body of water. That is what we call inter-specific competition. But there's another kind of competition. We could have members of the same species maybe competing for mates. And in this case, it's called intra-specific competition. So that's within one species. And so we're going to see that same species competing is going to be within a population because a population consists of organisms of the same species. When we're talking about inter-specific uh, competition, we're talking about competition in the community as a whole, because we've got to have at least two different populations or two different species, at the very least, competing for that same resource. All right? So although the terms sound very similar, we need to think about inter is between different populations, and intra is within one population. In other words, one species is involved in the competition alone. Now, have a look at this photograph. Here we've got two Heimsburg or Oryxes, and they appear to be having a conflict. What kind of competition is illustrated here? where they are both clearly from the same species, what would we call this? Would we call it interspecific competition or would we call it intraspecific competition? Well, remember, clearly they're both from the same species, so we're going to call it intraspecific competition, competition, within one species. Now, although the question didn't ask you, what do you think those two Kremsbocks could be in competition or in conflict over? Well, it could be that they're fighting for space. It could be that they're fighting for mates. So territory or mates, unless we could see the bigger picture, we wouldn't be able to work out precisely what they're fighting over, but they certainly are in competition. Now, the famous paramecium competition investigation showed us two different paramecium species. If you grew paramecium aurelia all by itself in a little water source, completely on its own, we would see this kind of very normal logistic growth. Likewise, if you took the other species, Paramecium cordatum, and you grew it separately or by itself, we'd see a very similar growth curve. But 
when the two species were grown together, something very interesting happened. We saw that both species started growing at more or less the same rate, but then look what happened to poor Paramecium caudatum. Paramecium aurelia was able to outcompete Paramecium caudatum. Right, so the word outcompete means that one population is able to survive far better in this conflict situation than the other. And that is something typical of inter-specific competition. Now, moving on to specialization. Specialization is very closely linked to competition. So when we talk about specialization, we're talking about competing for the same resource and we need to introduce a new term, ecological niche. Now, what is a niche? Well, a niche is the organism's habitat, where it lives, as well as the role that it plays in the environment. So, different species can live together in a community as long as they have slightly different niches. So let's have a look at this example of lions and leopards. They are both apex predators. They both hunt and catch similar kinds of prey species. So how are they both able to compete in a particular ecosystem when they are using the same prey species? Well, they'll have different behaviors. They will behave and specialize in different ways. They might capture their prey at different times. We know that leopards tend to hunt at night and leopards haul their prey up trees and store it in a kind of pantry up in a tree, whereas lions are going to hunt as prides or groups Leopards tend to hunt as solitary individuals. The lions will hunt and they will all eat on the ground. So we see that although they're living in the same habitat, they have different niches and this allows them to occupy the same space. Another example, we've got a giraffe, kudu and a little impala they all eat the leaves off the same tree. So we could see that this is going to result in competition. But competition is avoided because they undergo specialization. And here we can see clearly that they're eating at different levels. And so they're exploiting different niches. We've looked at predation, competition, and specialization. What remains is for us to focus on symbiosis. We've looked at a number of interactions in this lesson. We've looked at predation. We've looked at competition, and remember that competition and specialization are linked. And our focus now is to move on to symbiosis. Now, we need to clarify what this term symbiosis means in terms of life sciences, because like so many terms in life sciences, it has a general everyday meaning as well as a very specific scientific meaning. So if you talk about there's a good symbiosis going on in our class or in our school. It means that everyone's helping each other. And if you have a look at this little picture, there's, there's a sense of community and belonging and everyone is helpful to each other. Now that's what we mean about symbiosis in a very general situation or context. In life sciences, it has a 
very specific meaning. Symbiosis is a close interaction. When we talk about close, sometimes it can be so close that one of the organisms is living right inside the other organism. That's how close this interaction is going to be. So it's a close interaction, and here is something very important that is part of the life sciences definition that's not part of our everyday understanding of symbiosis. In life sciences, symbiosis is a very close relationship between two different species. So we're not talking about humans helping each other out and living symbiotically together. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about two members of different species that have evolved an extremely close living arrangement. And another important factor is that they're not only living in close contact with each other, but sometimes they can't live without each other. That's how close the symbiotic relationship is. Now, there are three kinds of symbiosis that you are going to be learning about. Mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. So we're going to focus on each of these kinds of relationships in turn, looking at some examples. So I hope you've got your pen and paper ready because let's start working our way through these different kinds of symbiotic relationships. The first one that we're going to meet is mutualism. Now I like to think of mutualism as a thumbs up, thumbs up, kind of relationship. We've got two different organisms, two different species, and both of them are thumbs up, which means that in mutualism, both organisms are benefiting. That's why we say it's thumbs up, thumbs up. So when we look at a mutualistic example, we can think of an organism that we recognize as lichen. And although it looks like lichen is one organism, in fact, it's made up of fungi living in this close relationship with algae. And it forms a structure called lichen. And both benefit so it's thumbs up for the fungus, thumbs up for the, the alga. How do each benefit? Well, the alga is a photosynthetic organism. So it is going to make food from sunlight. The fungus is going to have hyphae that penetrate down into a substrate to hold on and to absorb water from that substrate. So the alga is thumbs up benefiting because it's got an attachment onto substrate and it's getting water. The fungus is a thumbs up because it's getting organic food from the alga that's photosynthesizing. And in that way, both organisms are benefiting, so we call this mutualism. But symbiosis isn't always as happy as mutualism. In humans, there are certain harmless strains of a bacterium called Escherichia coli, which you don't have to remember. You can just simply call it E. coli. And E. coli lives inside your large intestine right now, inside your intestine, Escherichia coli is living. But it's not a bad living arrangement that the two of you have because E. coli is going to help to produce a substance called vitamin K that you need for your blood to clot. And it's going to help you digest your food. And in return, what have you got? 
The bacteria are in a lovely, dark, warm, protected environment, and they are simply swimming around in food inside your intestine. So there we go. That is a mutualistic, thumbs up, thumbs up kind of relationship. But I warned you, not all symbiotic relationships are thumbs up, thumbs up. So welcome to parasitism. Parasitism is a thumbs up, thumbs down kind of relationship. We have one organism benefiting, that is our parasite, and one organism, the host, that is the organism that is being harmed. So let's think of parasites. Lice, for example, that might be living inside your hair, they are deriving food and a secure place to breed. You, on the other hand, are being irritated, suffering from blood loss and itches. So for you, it's thumbs down. But for the lice, oh yeah, it's thumbs up all the way. The lice are really benefiting. And these are some other examples of protistin parasites Trypanosomes, which cause sleeping sickness, plasmodium that causes malaria, entamoeba that causes dysentery. In each case, it's the parasite thumbs up and the poor person who's sitting with this infectious disease thumbs down. So there we go, some examples of parasitism. And when we come back after the break, we will be focusing on other forms of symbiosis that we can also talk about and see whether they're thumbs up or thumbs down. See you after the break. Welcome back everyone. We are looking at the subtopic of symbiosis within different interactions in the environment. And so far, we've learned about thumbs up, thumbs up. What was that? Of course, mutualism. Thumbs up, thumbs down, one harmed, one benefits. That is parasitism. We're now going to move on to a third category of symbiosis and that is commensalism. Now in commensalism, we're going to see one organism benefits. So we've got one thumbs up. Now the other organism is not harmed, but it doesn't benefit either. It's kind of, eh, whatever. It doesn't hurt me, doesn't benefit me, but uh, you know what? Just let it carry on. So in commensalism, one organism is benefiting, but it's not harming the other organism in any way. It's also not benefiting them, but it means that this symbiotic relationship can just benefit one of the organisms in this relationship. Let's look at some examples. All right, so we have a look at the photograph there of buffaloes and egrets. Now, I don't want you to confuse those white birds with tick birds. They are egrets. In fact, they eat larger insects than little ticks, like grasshoppers, locusts, that kind of insect that would be found in the grass. And you know what, those insects are well camouflaged. They hide away perfectly. It really helps if you have a buddy system going where there's this enormous buffalo that's going to be walking through the grass and as it walks through the grass, it disturbs the insects. And all the egrets have to do is follow the buffalo and pick off the insects as they fly up into the air. It's a nice relationship. Who's a thumbs up for? 
clearly, it sums up for the egrets. They are benefiting from this relationship. All they have to do is hang around large herbivores. So you'll see them in relationships with buffalo, elephants, even other herds that are not quite as big in terms of the size of the animal, but are big in terms of the size of the herd. So big herds of zebra or wildebeest will also be followed by the egrets. Thumbs up for the egrets. They are following these other animals that are disturbing the insects and allowing the insects to fly up into the air and the egrets can pick off the insects. What about the buffalo? Quite frankly, the buffalo, look at its facial expression. That buffalo doesn't care. It's not helping the buffalo. It's also not harming the buffalo. So we've got the situation where one organism, the egret, is thumbs up. The other organism is, meh, whatever. I'm not harmed. I'm not benefited. That is commensalism. Let's look at another example of commensalism. All right, on this whale, you might see these little bumps. Now, those bumps are not part of the whale. Those little bumps are, in fact, another organism called a barnacle. And barnacles are a kind of crustacean. So you're probably thinking crabs. Yes, but crabs scuttle around. Barnacles are sedentary. They are fixed to a particular spot. So a barnacle has a little shell-like structure that's almost like a little volcano, and the barnacle itself sends out little legs, feelers, and very importantly, filter feeding appendages. And the barnacle sits on its rock, and it sticks out its little feeding appendages, and it filter feeds food from the water. But you know what? If it was filter feeding in one position, it's pretty limited in terms of the amount and variety of food that it could get. Imagine if the barnacle could be attached to another organism that is swimming through the water. So now the barnacle doesn't have to wait for the tide to bring in new organisms. The barnacle is the king. It's got a whale throne and it is cruising through the water attached to the whale and its little feeding appendages are out there filtering the water for any food. Barnacles are often also found attached to turtle shells. So as the turtle is swimming, the barnacle is kind of catching a bit of a joy ride in terms of being able to filter all this food out of the water. So in terms of thumbs up, thumbs down, what's happening here? Well, the barnacle is clearly benefiting. The barnacle says, yeah, food. The whale, the whale is, uh -huh, what? Something on my back, did you say? Sorry, didn't hear you. The barnacle is the one that benefits. The whale isn't harmed, and it certainly isn't benefited from this tiny little barnacle on its back. So here we've got another example of commensalism. We've worked our way through three different kinds of interactions symbiotic interactions, and this little poster summarizes it very nicely. Instead of thumbs up, thumbs down, it's got smiley faces. So, mutualism, the flower gets pollinated, the bee gets nectar, the way we were learning about it, thumbs up, thumbs up, or smiley faces all around. What about commensalism? Smiley face, for the barnacle, the whale, uh, whatever, I'm not harmed, I'm not benefited. Parasitism, smiley face for the tick, and 
sad face for the cat because the cat is getting an infection or an irritation because sometimes the ticks have other parasites inside their salivary glands and so this poor cat could even get tick bite fever from having this parasite attached to it. So I'd like you to summarize this section on symbiosis with thumbs ups and thumbs downs and whatever and that'll help you understand the nature of the particular symbiotic relationship that you might be asked to describe. So talking about being asked to describe, are you up for some questions? Let's practice some typical assessment tasks relating to interactions in the environment. All right, let's start with this one. How can farmers exploit predator-prey relationships? Now remember, we spoke about predator-prey relationships such as the lynx and the snowshoe hare. How could a farmer exploit this natural kind of relationship that might be going on in the farming ecosystem? Well, here is a ladybird beetle. And the most favorite thing a ladybird beetle likes to eat is a kind of bug called an aphid. Now, ladybird beetles don't harm other plant varieties, clearly, they're carnivorous. But aphids harm plant varieties. They stick a long proboscis into the phloem or the food transporting tissue of the plant and they suck out the food, which means that they are decreasing the plant's energy sources and decreasing the efficiency of the plant to produce food to grow bigger. And that's what the farm is all about, healthy food, not a space for aphids to grow. Aphids can also, like malaria mosquitoes, can they can carry parasites as well. So it's not a good thing for a farmer to have crops infested with aphids. But it could be a good thing if the farmer introduced the natural predator of the aphid. And so we find that the farmer can exploit or use to his or her benefit the predator-prey relationship between ladybird beetles and aphid bugs. And these farmers' best friends can help control the agricultural pests, which means that the farmer doesn't have to use pesticides or artificial chemicals to kill the aphids. And we all know about the problems associated with chemical warfare. In, in terms of farming and growing plants. So exploiting a natural predator-prey relationship, we can say thumbs up to the farmers, can't we? What about another question? Identify each kind of symbiotic relationship. So we've got to say what the relationship is and is there harm or benefit? So here we have a little tick bird, it's actually called an ox pecker, and here we have an impala. Here we have a shark, and this is called a remora fish. And here we have a caterpillar, which is the larval stage of a butterfly or a moth, and here we have some eggs. Let's look at this picture and what we have to do, what kind of relationship is going on here and who's being harmed and who's benefiting. Well, clearly our ox picker is benefiting. Thumbs up to the ox picker. Thumbs up to the impala as well because that little ox picker is taking ticks off, external parasites like ticks off the impala the impala benefits because it's getting rid of these parasites and the ox peck is benefiting because its tummy is getting full and it's getting food. 
So this one is mutualism. What about the shark and the remora fish? This is another instance of barnacles and whales. The remora fish swims along with the shark. It's so tiny, it's not gonna harm the shark. It's also not gonna benefit the shark in any way. So for the shark, it's uh, whatever. But for the remora fish, it's going to catch little pieces of food because let's face it, sharks don't have good eating habits. They rip their prey apart and there's all little pieces of food floating around in the water that the remora fish can in fact grab and eat. So we're looking at commensalism. This is the sad story of the parasitized caterpillar. We've got a caterpillar that a wasp has actually, the cheek of it, laid her eggs inside the living caterpillar. And when the eggs are going to hatch, the eggs are going to benefit. Those little baby wasps are going to benefit because they've got a food source right there. And the poor caterpillar is going to have literally its insides sucked out. All right, some kind of horror story going on here called parasitism. What interaction is being shown here? Well, here we've got different kinds of birds, and we can see that some birds have long necks and long legs, some can dive, some are going to be feeding on the shore, some right up here on the sand, and what we've got going on here is niche partitioning. We've got five different species of water birds that can survive in the same habitat by specializing in terms of their food habits. What kind of competition is illustrated and what resource is being competed for? Lion, hyena. Therefore, two different species. We are looking at interspecific competition for food. Here we're looking at the same species, ibex, fighting with each other either over territory or mates. Different species, the zebra and the chemsbok. Here we go, they are in competition over water. And here we've got the same chicks in competition with each other same species for food. I've put together a little summary for you that goes through the main kinds of interactions that we have discussed in our lesson. And we've looked at lots of new terminology that must land up inside your glossary. But that's it for this lesson. Please join me again next time and we're going to be looking at human populations, but for today, goodbye.